Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with coach, writer, and ex-GB sprinter, Craig Pickering. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to episode 25 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. I have an athlete on the phone today in Craig Pickering. Craig was a 100 meter sprinter uh, and later transferred over to bobsled uh, for various different reasons. Really excited to get Craig on this on the show today. The reason I wanted to get Craig on was I'm really interested in the story behind, behind Craig and how he came through the ranks uh, and how he was kind of seen as the saviour of British athletics in the in the uh, early 2000s when he was still very, very young. And the transition he's made into coaching, which really interests me. Today, we talk about how he came through the system, uh, what was expected of him and, and the pressure that he had to deal with. I also get into the, the training of a sprinter, of a 100 meter sprinter, who's uh, got Olympic experience, world, uh, world championship experience. That's really, really interesting. We also delve into what he's learned from different coaches and how his philosophies have evolved over time. I also touch on drugs and athletics, because I think that's a really uh, interesting subject at the minute, especially what's going on in Russia and, and various different places. So Craig gives us his really strong opinions on, um, on drugs and athletics. Just before we get onto the episode with Craig, just wanted to say a massive thank you to those that have been tuning in lately. Uh, just looked at the stats and we're up to nearly 20,000 20, downloads. So a massive thank you to those that have been stick, but stuck around from the, from the start uh, and those newbies that are uh, just, just discovering it. If you do want to check out older episodes of the podcast, you can pop over to pacedperformance.co.uk and you can get all the previous episodes on there. You can also see the show notes of previous episodes and any any resources that were mentioned by the by myself or any of the guests. You can you can get links to them on there. You can also subscribe on iTunes and YouTube, and you can keep up to date with everything that's going on the podcast if you follow me on Twitter at Pacey Perform. And just one very last thing: Ross Burberry, who was in the early edition of the podcast and featured in the special edition of the podcast with Nick Grantham and Nathan Winder is holding a, a workshop called Season in a Day Workshop through Creating Athletes. That's going to take place at Nottingham Trent University on Sunday the 15th of March from 9.30 till 4.30 at a cost of £65. Ross is doing that with Brent Dickinson, who is the Head of Academy Strength and Conditioning at Nottingham Forest, and Chris Thorpe, who is the Under-21 Sports Scientist. So if anyone is interested, visit creatingathletes.com go to the shop uh, and you can get it on there and if you want to follow Ross on Twitter he is at Ross Burberry and that's B-U-R-B-E-A-R-Y but without me plugging anything else here is the interview with Craig Pickering Welcome to the Pace of Performance podcast thanks for tuning in Today, I have got Craig Picker on the line, and it's not very often you get a guy who's competed at the Olympic Games and the World Championships, so really a pleasure to have him on. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Craig. Hi, thanks for having me. No problem at all. Do you want to, just before we get going, do you want to give the listeners uh, a bit of a, a background and education in what you're currently doing? Yeah, so I guess I'm probably most famous for being an athlete, so... I was quite good when I was young. I, um, I won medals at the World Under-18, European Under-20, European Under-23 Championships, um, over 100 metres, um, European Indoor Championships, over 60 metres. And when I was an athlete, I went to four World Championships and the Beijing Olympic Games. Um, in 2012, I got injured. Um, I had to have back surgery, which meant I missed the whole 2012 season. And as a result of that, I lost my athletics funding. And so I had a choice to either get a real job, which I didn't really fancy, or find someone else to give me some money to do sport. And British Bob Stay approached me and said they'd be quite happy to sort of give me a go and see how I was. Uh, so I went down, I was quite good. I uh, did Bob Stay for just over a year and competing in one World Championships and Olympic Games, which well, I was picked for Olympic Games, but when I got there, I got injured, which meant I had to retire. So I was, um, I think I'm the eighth British athlete to qualify for summer and winter games. So that's been quite an elite group. 
Wow. And then since I retired, I've been doing a bit of sort of contracting stuff for various companies. And the company I work for now is it's called DNA Fit. So we do genetic testing for sports people, also just people on the street as well. So there's, there's sort of two strands to the company. One aspect is professional sport. One aspect is just, I guess, your weekend warriors. Um, so I cover both both aspects there. Cool. cool. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, DNA Fit? I know we had a little chat beforehand, but just tell us a little bit more about the, the company itself. Yeah, so that's the company itself is probably two two or three years old. Um, and in the last year, it's really started to take off a little bit. So um, what we do as a company is we sort of test 50 different genes, and these genes are strongly linked um, to both exercise and diet outcomes. So on the exercise front, we can test someone and give them a good idea but how well they respond to both endurance and power training. And then we can make recommendations based on their physical training on that. And we also test for recovery, injury risk, and um, aerobic potential because aerobic capacity is has quite a, quite a large genetic component. And then on the diet side, um, we can tell you what your optimum diet type is. So some people respond really well to low-fat diet. Some people, if they're on a low-fat diet, actually struggle to lose weight, so they need to be in a high-carbohydrate diet, and there's genes quite strongly linked to that as well. So we give a good good indication on that, and then we look at micronutrients and various food intolerances just to give an overall picture. So within professional sports, professional sports teams, they quite like the injury prevention aspect of it because we can tell them players are at risk. Um, so if they've just signed a player and they don't really know the kind of thing that they should be doing, we can give them a good idea. So overall, our main aim is just to try and avoid the trial and error, which goes on a lot, a lot of training. So different people respond to different training programs, and until you've done that training program, you don't really know whether you respond to it or not. What we're saying is we can give you a good idea early on so you can remove all the trial and error and spend more time doing training that suits you or a diet that suits you a bit more. Mm. No, that sounds good. And just touch on your education. You've got a degree in sports science, is that right? Yeah, so I went to Bath University. Um, to do to do sport and exercise science so I was it was good I enjoyed it I mean growing up I really was once I started doing athletics when I was about 14 I started to get really interested in the physical and the, the sort of science side of that um and so I did a level PE and really enjoyed that and went to university to do it and then I graduated in 2009 um and obviously being being a professional sports person it's quite hard to then do something else I considered doing a master's but I, I thought I didn't really have the time to do that so I just tried to stay on top of sort of current trends and we know for us working with the support staff, so biomechanists, nutritionists, physiologists, that kind of thing, I was always asking questions and trying to learn a lot more about it, in part trying to improve my performance, but also to try and just understand the whole process around professional sport a bit more. Mm. No, that's cool. So I just want to move on a little bit and talk. just talk about the, the kind of pressures of an athlete. I read a little, um, a little article that, for obviously from quite a few a number of years ago, about you being the saviour of British athletics. Um, and just talked about the pressure that was on you coming through the system at such a young age. Yeah, I, th- I think I was sort of I was coming through in a period of time where there was a lot of scrutiny on British athletics. So, for, I guess I first sort of came into the public consciousness in two thousand five when I won the European Juniors and I, I beat Darren Campbell in a race who'd won the Olympics the year before. And I went to the World Senior Championships as well, and that was also the year that we were awarded the London Olympics. So a lot of the press started to sort of try and look at the top junior athletes and see who would sort of go on to win a medal at the London Olympic Games. Um, in terms of pressure, I never actually felt pressure too much. I was always very internally motivated to do well and any pressure that I felt was generally from from within. Um, I used to put a lot of pressure on myself to perform, which as I got older, I sort of learned perhaps wasn't that healthy and tried to remove, remove that. There's only one period of time where I felt a lot of external pressure to perform and that was the, in the indoor season in 2008 when Dwayne Chambers was making a comeback and um, in the run-up to that I'd been quite outspoken on my points of view about people that were taking drugs and my point hasn't really changed I still finished with Band for Life but that was sort of jumped on by the medium people had to try and make it out but me versus Dwayne Chambers which wasn't the case there was other good athletes around as well um, but I kind of got involved when I was quite young, sort of 21, so I got a bit more involved in that. And I sort of went into that race feeling um, quite a lot of pressure and consequently underperformed. So that was a real learning experience for me, just to try and remove yourself from all the external things. Don't you know, don't try and spur things on the media, just stay out of it and focus on yourself. Um, but yeah, so in terms of pressure, 
that was probably the, the only time I actually felt a lot of external pressure. But I was aware from a young age that people were sort of taking a bit more interest in myself and, and writing a bit more about me. Mm, cool. So let's talk, get on to train talk. Um, so we've we had, I think, uh, one athlete on the on the podcast before, and that was Andy Titrell, uh, rugby union. But what, and he kind of went in a bit of depth on what a normal week would look like uh, when he was back playing. Um, what would a, what would a sprint athlete go through in season, week to week? In season, um, in the actual competitive season, we're quite mm. fortunate in as much that we don't actually have to do that much training because our main focus is to make sure that we're recovered for races so sprinting is quite an intense activity it's a lot of load on our central nervous system and the sort of the your muscles and joints and various structures like that take a lot of pressure from actual sprint running so the main aim is to a recover from the previous race which can take depending on the athlete up to two weeks and then the next aim is to go into your next race in good condition so you actually don't do a lot of real hardcore sprint training you might be focusing on a specific technical aspect which you're not quite getting right so if your start's not quite right you might do a bit of work on that um but acceleration work isn't as central nervous system intensive as max velocity work so you're quite fortunate there so in season we generally try and use the races as the main stimulus and you, you space them adequately enough to make sure you get the stimulus off season it's quite a bit different so there's a lot there's a lot of a lot more running so the most i ever did in a week was sort of four running sessions alongside three weight sessions and two rehabilitation based sessions so you know, a reasonable training load that was as a sprinter mm-hmm. so how would that how would you um how would that go from monday to sunday how would that look so would it would be a a sprint session in the morning gym session in the afternoon on a monday how, how would that work out it depends mostly on the coach and the coach i work with and their philosophy so okay if i was doing my own sessions i might have done I, well i would have done things differently to how my coaches did did it but as as a prof- as a senior athlete, I had two coaches um, in my career. So the, the first one that I had as a senior was a guy called Malcolm Arnold, who used to coach Colin Jackson and was coaching Jason Gardner um, and had been around for quite a long time. And his philosophy was pretty different to my second coach, a guy called Michael Kamel, um, who had coached Matt Shervington, the Australian sprinter, to 10 um, So things were done a bit differently. Malcolm was we used to train once a day, um, we started on a Sunday and we'd, we'd do our probably our hardest track session on Sunday, so we came in nice and fresh. Monday we'd do weights, um, so sort of three sets of six. Tuesday we'd do, depending on the season, we might do a longer running session at lower intensity or we might sort of focus a little bit more on, on block starts. Wednesday we'd do weights again. Um, Thursday some more sprint and then Friday an easier weight session. So the train load was reasonably low. Tried to have the quality of the sessions really, really high. And then when I switched to Michael Kamel, his background was a bit different. So he was sort of brought up in the Russian system because he's from, he's from Ukraine, so he's part of the USSR. And um, you could see sort of how that impacts on his philosophy. And then he'd gone to Australia and he'd also worked in the US trying to learn from a couple of the top US coaches. So he had a very sort of wide range of philosophy. Um, and we did things a little bit differently. So Monday, with, with, we'd start on Monday with him with a, a technical sprint session so that we were nice and fresh you could focus on the technical aspect of a bit more and then in the afternoon we'd go and do olympic weightlifting so that would be our again probably our main olympic lifting session of the week so monday was a real high load tuesday then in the morning we do an easier tempo running session so maybe three sets of four 150s in not particularly quick in 25 seconds or so with 90 seconds recovery so in trainers just sort of flush out the system and then on Tuesday afternoon, we'd do circuit-based training to just aid muscle building and get some pre-rehabilitation training there. Wednesday morning, we'd be in the gym doing our secondary weight session, so mostly upper body, not really Olympic lifting, because on Thursday morning, we have our second sprint session of the week, which would, again, be pretty high intensity. Thursday afternoon, we'd do circuits. Friday morning we do Olympic lifting, so we could hit that quite hard. And then Saturday we'd have our not a speed session, but a more speed endurance session. So maybe 150s, 200, 250s, but as quick as you could. But because it was the end of the week, the fatigue level was higher. Um, so that worked. That session worked quite nicely. You were tired going into it, so you weren't going to overload yourself too much. But you could focus on maintaining the right technique and the fatigue, which was quite important. So you see, 
those two coaches had reasonably different philosophies and how they approach things, um, which was good for me to learn from. Um, but then I guess if I was to do things, I'd take different aspects of them and mix it together into one to get slightly different results. So obviously working with coaches that have worked with big names that you mentioned there, how, how what little things would you tweak and change, you know, taking both of them into account and both of them coaches? Well, the problem is, is you don't know how things are going to work until you do them, mm-hmm. um, which is obviously a difficult thing to do. But I think what I'd do is I'd, I'd have less load overall in my training than I did with Michael Kamel because sometimes I felt the load was a little bit too high for myself, although other athletes in my group responded well to that. But I'd probably have a bit more load than what Malcolm gave me. So I'd, I'd sort of work in the middle of there. I think I'd stagger my day slightly differently. So I'd, I'd try and do what Charlie Francis did, which was have a high-intensity day followed by a really low-intensity day, then a high-intensity day. Then I might have a day off and then go high-intensity, low-intensity again. So you get three... High intensity days, two low intensity days, and on the high intensity days, I do a sprint and a weight session, uh, morning and afternoon. That's what I'd use as my starting point, and then I'd tweak around there. But again, I didn't just learn physical training aspects from them; I learned technical aspects of them from them as well. Michael Kamel was someone who really sort of studied the technical aspect of it. So a lot of what I learned from him in the three years that I worked with him, I've sort of taken forward. And when I work with people now. The technical aspects that I learned from him are the, are the things I try and implement into other people's training. Hmm. So that them them specific te- technical aspects would they would they be transferable to kind of uh, non track and field athletes? Yeah. So okay. the way I look at it is that running's a skill, sprinting's a skill. So elite sprinters do things that non elite sprinters don't do, and they're doing those things for a reason, and that's not natural. So they've learned to put their body parts in different positions with specific timing. And if you're not doing that, you'll be making, I guess, losses in your performance. So one thing I want to try and do is if I'm brought in to work with a sports club, I'm not being brought in to work with them on a physical aspect. So I don't do any physical training. I just do the technical stuff. So I try and teach them all how to use the different body parts, put them in, in space and time and, I try and have a progressive program where they, if they can do drills at a low intensity, then I try and add a bit more speed um, and then add a fatigue aspect in it so they can maintain it under fatigue. Um, and it generally works pretty well. I mean, if I just take one aspect, most people don't contact the floor with their feet very well when they sprint. They kind of slap the floor a little bit and that causes a lot of energy loss. So that's just one very quick change you can make when you go into sports clubs is just to teach them to have pre-tension in their foot. So when they contact the floor, they're much stronger and they don't collapse quite as much. Um, so you can make you can make quite a big changes early on, and the feedback I get from a lot of the players is that they they notice this, this difference quite quickly. So just going on to that a little bit more, what kind of techniques would you use for for that particular aspect? So most people don't keep their toes up when they sprint, and but elite sprinters do all the time. So they have always have their toes pulled up. So there's there's pretension in the calf, so that when they contact the floor and they they flex their ankle a little bit to contact the floor, they're nice and strong, and that keeps their contact time low. And, and one thing we see from all the studies is that elite sprinters have a shorter contact time than um, non-elite sprinters. So although they're producing more force, they're producing this force in much, much less time. Um, so if you want to get someone quicker, decreasing contact time is one way to do that. And the secondary way is to make their stride longer. So I do a lot of work on front side mechanics, being able to get their knee nice time in front of their body and be able to let their lower leg escape out a little bit in the strides so then cover more ground. Again, if you watch people run... Um, naturally they'll have a high their foot will go very high behind their body whereas if you watch elite sprinters run they won't do that they'll strip they'll stop their upper thigh going behind their body so they're not not a massive amount of hip extension past the midline and they'll actively pull their foot and their knee up in front of their body so they can cover more ground um with each stride so they're, they're the two main things i try and work on is improving stride length primarily through getting the knee higher in the front of the body reducing time behind the body and then reducing ground contact time um, by having sort of pre-tension in the calf. And there's other aspects that play into that a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was watching something on uh, on Twitter, I think. Somebody put a slowed down sprint of your mate, your mate Dwayne Chambers. Um, <laughs> is, but is, there any, is there any particular sprinter that you'd say his technique is absolutely near perfect? Every, well, every sprinter has their own little sort of, I guess, unique style. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Asafa Powell is, is very, very good. If you watch him in his prime, sort of, I think I remember watching him run in 2007, 2008, he essentially eliminated anything going on behind his body. So as soon as his foot touched the floor, he was actually picking up forward. Um, so he, that looked really, really good. Um, so yeah, he, he was good. I mean, most sprinters do most things almost perfectly correct. There's just small changes you'd make um, to most of them. But yeah, Asafa Powell is, is generally very, very good. Cool. So how did your... How did your training personally change with the transfer over to bobsled? With bobsled, you've got there's sort of two aspects to your push performance. There's an aspect of resisted acceleration, so you're pushing a heavy sled, admittedly on a surface which hasn't got much friction, but there's still weight there. So your acceleration is almost slower than in a sprint performance, so you've got to overcome more external force. But then because you're going downhill and the sled picks up momentum, you've then got a stage of maximum velocity where you've got to keep almost keep up with the sled. If you're running behind the sled, slower than the sled can go, you're going to slow it down, um, which you don't want. So it essentially became about, A, being able to accelerate really quickly under under load, and then B, having a high max velocity. So there's no speed endurance phase, which is good news because then you don't have to do the longer, harder sessions. <laughs> and then set, uh, aspects as well as body weight. So most elite bobsledders are probably in the region of 100 kilos to 110 kilos. And as an athlete, I was 83, 84 kilos. So I thought, well, I have to get, I might not get to 100 kilos, but I have to get as close to that as I could um, through sort of a mass building phase. So over the course of about a year, I put on just over 10 kilos. Um, so when I qualified for the Olympics, I weighed in my race kit about 97 kilos. So in the gym, it became about putting on muscle and as it was one aspect, I'm able to produce a lot of force against the sled and then on the track it became about real acceleration especially on under load and then a max velocity aspect as well so basically we just cut out long running and sort of the secondary weight stuff so did the guys who were in your in your squad were they um all ex-sprinters or they come into to bobsled initially they were almost exclusively ex-athletes not necessarily okay. sprinters but that kind of ilk so in apart from the pilots who were usually from the military um, because they'd had the background to be able to go and learn to do that in, in the military. So in the UK, no one grows up wanting to do bobsleigh. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit different to other countries. So you generally attract people who haven't quite achieved the success they'd perhaps like in their primary sport. So in Great Britain 1, the brakemen were Stu Benson, who was a sort of 10, 500 metre runner. I think he's a 780 long jumper who transferred across. Um, Bruce Tasker, who was... Welsh indoor 400 metre under 20 record holder, um, sort of a 21 deadish 200 metre runner, and Joel Fearon, um, who'd run, I think he's run 10.11 seconds, so pretty good as, as a sprinter. And they were in GB1 and in, in my crew, GB2, um, as myself, a guy called Ben Simons, who is, again, a, a decent long jumper, sort of 780 ish, um, and a, a pretty good sprinter as well, very handy over, over 60. And then John Baines, who had gone to English schools as a sprinter in his, in his youth. So we had speed and athleticism in abundance, and then all of them had sort of had to come in, come in and try and put in a bit bit more weight to get into the more of the bobsleigh physicality. Mm. No, that's cool. I mean, we've, I just want to go on to a little topic that you touched on before um, about drugs and athletics. Obviously, it's been for a number of years, obviously, all over the media. But do you want to give us your take? I know you mentioned it before. There's, there is quite a take there. Um, do you want yeah. to give us your take on that? Yeah, so I think I'd probably start by saying people in elite sport do take drugs, but it's nowhere near as prevalent as people think, I would say. So in my opinion, most of the top sprinters are not taking drugs. They're very naturally talented, and that's what gets them through. The people that generally cheat are the people that aren't quite good enough and are looking for, for a step up. Um, what do I think on top of that is that people who deliberately, systematically take drugs over a period of time um, as part of a doping program have deliberately defrauded the sport and the public and their, their fellow athletes, so they should be banned for life. People that have had accidental positives, um, such as stimulants in sports, drinks, or if they've taken a supplement that's been contaminated, if they, as long as they can show that they've done all in their power to ensure that they try to mitigate against that they should have a lean a more lenient sentence um but yeah so i don't think i think the media like to portray that a lot of people take drugs 
And I think people that aren't successful in sport like to think that everyone that's better than them takes drugs because that's an excuse made for them to to not have to look at their own performance. They can just say, oh, this person's beat me because they've taken drugs. I mean, in my career, I never ever saw anyone taking drugs. I saw some people that, were, it was people that I thought were taking drugs and they looked a bit shifty, but I never saw anything with my own eyes. And in terms of the British team, I'm pretty sure since I've been around, 99.9% of them have not been taking drugs. Mm. I mean, there was a, obviously a documentary that pretty much everyone saw, uh, the Lance Armstrong uh, saga, and obviously it was so widespread with so many officials involved and doing things obviously they shouldn't be doing. But is is that kind of um, big involvement of officials and things, yeah. are people thinking that's going in athletics or is it more kind of little groups of, of bits and bobs going on? I think it depends on the country you're in. So what, mm-hmm. what's going out of Russia now is like a, a lot of the countries, coaches and officials probably knew stuff was going on. Uh, same, same as Australia, there's a, a book called Positive by Discus for a um, he's called Werner Rita, who, who wrote that. And um, he described that he was taking drugs and everyone knew he was taking drugs. So I guess it depends upon the culture. In the UK, the, the UK and doping authority are very strong on making sure that people aren't taking drugs and educated from an early age. And I don't think, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't cover up a positive drugs test can't say the same for other countries, but you'd like to think that while there will be cracking down on, on those countries and testing at-risk people. I, I know there's a few years ago, there's, it sort of came out of Jamaica that people weren't getting out of competition testing. Um, so hopefully that, that's changing and eventually it'll become sort of the same rules for everyone. So elite athletes will get out of competition testing quite a few times a year. And if, there's a, if there is a positive test and that's released straight away and um, the athletes made to become accountable for that, hopefully that that'll be become a bit more apparent but yeah I guess it depends each nation has their own prerogative really and some nations probably are a bit dodgy um, <laughs> but hopefully wider will crack down a bit bit more on that mm. yeah it's cool I mean I saw you, uh, you you wrote an article on Freelap USA which puts some great stuff out by the way um, some of your thoughts on prevention of hamstring injuries do you want to just, just sum up that article for us uh, yes. and your kind of your take on that yeah, so, so my goal from that was basically just to give an outline of what science is saying about hamstring injuries. So if you're a sprinter, you probably have had a hamstring injury at some point in your career. I had quite a lot. Um, mostly when I was younger and I was running, I guess I was probably running times a little bit quicker than my body could handle. So my hamstring would be, hamstrings would be the first area to sort of break down. And as I got older and a bit more physically developed and focused on hamstring injury prevention, I actually got very, very few hamstring injuries. So you just have to make sure in, in a nutshell, that the hamstring can meet the demands that you're putting upon it. So it has to have eccentric and concentric strength. So a lot of people just tend to focus on the concentric aspect, um, but eccentric portions of the hamstring contraction during sprinting is really important. So you have to train that aspect of it. And then you just have to manage load upon the hamstring. So um, because hamstrings are quite active during sprint performance, they're going to fatigue um, perhaps quicker than other muscles. So you have to make sure that when you're doing high velocity sprint sessions, when the hamstrings are already at risk, you monitor the load and how well your athlete or you as an athlete are responding to that load. So if you're going to pull a hamstring in a training session, my experience tells me it's usually in the last two reps. So you just have to make sure that in in those repetitions, either A, you don't do them if you can't handle them, or if you do do them, you do them at low velocity, or thirdly, your technique is really, really good throughout it all. And then another important aspect is to never ever, if you do injure your hamstring, don't rush back because re-injury is really, really common. And if you can avoid having a hamstring injury, that's great as well because having had a prior hamstring injury, that, that's a quite a big risk factor for a future injury. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the main thing is just, just to be able to make sure that your hamstrings can sort of meet the demands of a sprint performance, to be honest. So from, from your experience, um, work doing the gym for injury prevention in the hamstrings, specifically what, were you, what worked for you? Um, so... On the hamstrings, I did Russian, sorry, Romanian deadlifts, so eccentric lowering of the, of the hamstrings, which was really, really useful. I love that exercise quite a lot as well because it teaches um, good hip hinge mechanics, which some people lack, so it's quite a good good one. Um, loaded bridges to make sure your glutes, and there's a little bit of hamstring in there as well, but you get the glutes a little bit. Um, single leg hang snatch is quite good for at least sort of, a, you, you practice your landing on one leg, which 
trains the hamstrings quite well as well. So they they were probably the main three. Your hamstring obviously gets condi- some condition as well from from sprinting, um, which plays in a little bit as well. But those were the main exercises that I used. Cool. Just want a last couple of things. Um, you've got a, a blog over at craigprickering.com. Do you want to just give us, I'm in, always interested to see when people have got a blog, the kind of vision behind it. So you just want to give us a little bit of vision behind yours? Yeah, I guess it was just to sort of be a, a place where I could put my ideas together. So I sort of have a lot of thoughts. I read a lot of books, a lot of articles. And if you don't do something to commit that to memory, you can forget that. So you know, to write articles, I've, find is a good way to be able to commit those things to memory and, and, and remember them further down the line so I wanted a place where I could write articles and then if I'm going to write them I might as well publish them so that was the idea behind my blog and then since I started doing that I've been asked to write for Freelap which is where probably most of my articles now are hosted um, and I've also been asked to write for another website quite soon so although I've got my blog I seem to be publishing less and less of my own articles although I can still put articles that aren't suitable for Freelap or, or the other blog. Um, like So recently I did a review of the books I'd been reading last year, which wasn't really suitable for the other blog, so I could stick it on there. And again, it was just a nice place for me to review what I'd done. I've got it recorded down now, and whilst I was writing it, I could recall the things that I'd read and the lessons that I'd learned, which is quite useful. Mm. So, and I've read that. It came in a four-part series, three-part series? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Books. Uh, yeah. So which ones were you... Uh, your go-to books reflecting on what you read last year? Um, I, th- I think the best one I read was an infographics book um, uh-huh. called Information is Beautiful, um, which doesn't really help coach you. It was just a, quite a visually spectacular book. Another good one I read was by N- Nate Silver, which is called The Signal and the Noise, um, which is about making predictions and how quite often as humans, if we want to make a prediction, we think we found something which explains it, but that's just noise and we can't actually see the, the, the right signal. Um, so as a coach, if you're monitoring certain things, which might be showing you that performance is going to be good, but then you go and perform, your athlete goes and perform and the performance is terrible, you've lost the signal, which was that the athlete was going to underperform in the noise. So for example, if if as a sprint coach, you're monitoring your athlete's one rep maxes, and then that one rep max is going up in, say, the power clean, which is quite quite an important lift for sprinting, and you see that your athlete's getting stronger, stronger, stronger. And you think, oh, great, my athlete's going to go and run quicker. And they go and run slower. You've lost the signal, which is that the athlete was going to run slower through the noise of tracking the one-rep max. So what I took from that was it's, it's very important to understand is what you're monitoring making a difference um, and is it the right signal and finding a way around that. And then also a second part of that was that sometimes you think you've found the right signal, but it's just a random chance. So it gave a really good example of a, a Russian chess player who was playing on an IBM computer and the computer could think much further ahead than the chess player or so the chess player thought um, and the computer made a move which the chess player couldn't understand and the computer resigned um, and the chess player won and he, he went back to his hotel room that night and played the game on and he, he realised that the computer would lose in 90 moves time and so he thought the computer could figure out 90 moves ahead but what actually happened is the computer had crashed and just made a <laughs> random move and so he didn't win a game after that because he just convinced himself the computer was so good. Whereas what had happened is there'd just been a random error within the computer and he'd, his performance had then suffered. So that was quite quite an important book. Mm. So what was that book again? Um, Signal and the Noise by okay. Nate, Nate, Nate Silver. Cool. I'll um, I'll put a link to on that on the, to your website um, on the show notes for this this episode. But where, so where other place? What other places can people keep in touch with what what you've got going on? Twitter, um, Facebook? Yeah, Twitter's probably the best place. So I tend to throw most things out through there, which is at Craig100M. Um, and then if you want to be friends with me on Facebook, that's fine as well. I'll accept most people. Um, so if you sort of keep abreast of me across those two things, you'll find most things that I'm doing. Cool. Well, I'll round it up there. And just thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate you uh, you coming on. Oh, no problem at all. Cool. And I will um, thank you again. And I'll speak to you shortly. Yeah, great. Cheers. Okay, mate. See you later. See you. Bye. Bye, mate. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to episode 25 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Craig. I love it when there's a a great story behind a coach, uh, and obviously Craig has got that. If you do want to check out 
previous episodes of the podcast, you can shoot over to pastedperformance.co.uk. You can also get the show notes of each episode uh, and any any resources uh, and links that were mentioned in this episode and previous episodes will be on there so you can get easy access to that. Don't forget to check out Craig's blog at craigpickering.com uh, and check out his articles on Freelap USA. And don't forget to check back over the next couple of weeks because I've got some great guests coming up. And I will speak to you in episode 26.